Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Golf Lovers United podcast. I am Ben, Golf Lover UK, and I'm joined by Stuart Manley. Headlines are, Stuart's got his DP World Tour card back. We'll chat about it in a moment, and it will be a fantastic interview. And I think it's going to strike a chord with many of you, because Stuart's um, 44, had been off tour for a while, won his tour card back. It's a great story. We'll talk about the fact that he was nearly a professional footballer. We'll talk about all these different things, and we'll talk about the chipping tip that he gave me that he's already forgotten about. We discussed it before the show started. He gave me a chip, chipping tip when we played together in a Pro-Am event over at Sunningdale Heath. Stuart, great to have you on the show. And how does it feel to be back on tour? Cheers, Ben. Yeah, it feels great, mate, to be honest. Uh, it's been a couple of years. I think 2019, I last had my card. And obviously with COVID and all that kind of stuff, um, just very relieved to get it back now. And um, yeah, looking forward to the season. I think when we met was just after COVID when when you when your card had gone and things right. like, and you 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 actually said to me that because um, I was moaning about not being able to play golf and you said to me about how lucky you were because you get you talk about your you talk very passionate about Mountain Ash about your golf club and yeah, how yeah. supportive they'd been so uh, not that we all want to relive COVID but do you want to just give me a couple of minutes or talk about Mountain Ash and what they did for you during that COVID period because I know many people struggle to get on a course. And, yeah, Mount Nash have uh, always been great since I was a child. Um, great old golf course. Uh, I live just down the road from it. And yeah, during COVID, it was great. I basically was able to practice because obviously that was a workplace. I could go to work and I had the whole golf course to myself. It was amazing, to be honest. Um, it helped my game no end, obviously. And I was ready then to uh, get back into tournament golf, having plenty of months of practice on my own. It was great. And so let's let's just... I want to go to the beginning because I think it's great to hear the story. And but I want I want to just focus very quickly on this 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 period before the the going back on tour. But how was it having been a tour player to lose the card? Do you want to just talk to me and the audience about? It's a real kick in the teeth, and it's a huge drop in possible income. All those sorts of stuff. What's it like when you lose your card? It is. You're right, Ben. It's brutal to be fair, and I've lost my card a few times, unfortunately. Um, I keep getting it back, but keep losing it. But hopefully this time I'll I'll keep it. But it is like you said, the loss of income. Obviously, the DP World Tour, you're playing for a lot of money. Um, potential earnings are very high, whereas the European Challenge Tour, the drop off in earnings is massive. And unless you play great on the Challenge Tour, you're not going to earn any money. You literally only play the Challenge Tour basically to get back on the DP World. But um, you're not doing it for a financial gain at all. So it is very tough here. Yeah, I saw, I think it wasn't this year, it was last year, you won an event on the Challenge Tour. And I think, did you walk away like something like 16 grand? I was like, bloody hell, he's won the event and got... It, no, it, it, what, I, like I won an event this year, I won 43,000. Yeah. Last year, did I win one last year? No, I won one the year before and I won, I think, 27 or 30. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so obviously that they, they just shows how much the challenge tour has improved actually in a couple of years. So um although it's still obviously not great, but they are trying their best and the prize money is slightly improving. Obviously it's nowhere near what the D P world is, but um you've got to play great obviously on the challenge tour. Like last year I played very, very solid on the challenge tour and I think I won like thirty five thousand roughly euros. Um with all your expenses added on top of that, it's very tough to um, to live. But I've, I've been lucky with a couple of really good sponsors. And like I said, like you're playing the Challenge Tour really to get that DP card. So thankfully, you know, it happened for me this year. And that, and that is the case when I speak to a few players who are on the Challenge Tour. It feels like people are, they play on the sort of the, the, the Alp Tour and some of the other tours to get to the Challenge Tour, to then get to the DP World Tour. And I was speaking to a golfer, Oh, I won't say his name because it's unfair. Um, I was speaking to a golfer who did two years on what was the old Euro Pro Tour. Yeah. And he said to me that you basically need someone who's going to, a sponsor or a family member who's going to give you £65,000. This was eight, nine years ago. He said, you need someone who's going to give you sixty five grand to be able to be on the Euro Pro Tour for a year because that's the money you need to get through, pay your caddy, enter events, this, that and the other. People think you make money being a pro golfer. It's it's hard to make money, isn't it? It is hard to. I don't think. I think that's slightly exaggerated. You need sixty five thousand. Um, I played in two thousand and twelve and played maybe fifteen events, and you literally don't spend more than uh, seven hundred pound a week, maybe. Mm. 
So if you do the oh, math, he meant to subsidise his income, as in to provide him an income. So to have an actual income and yeah. play golf, that was sort of the, the ballpark figure he had because because he didn't have a job. He was literally just trying to grind to make it. Potentially, yeah, I could see that. But yeah, seems seems a lot. But like going back, it is very tough. Obviously, you play in the Europro. Most guys who play Europro are guys who've just turned pro and they're, they're seeking the experience. It was a great little tour, to be fair. Like I played, I think, in 2011 or 12, one of the years I played it. And it was a great little feeder tour. And then, obviously, the jump up the challenge tour, I think, is obviously even worse because then you've got 30 events around the world, whereas, you know, Africa, Asia, China, whatever you've got to go, it's, it's a lot more expensive than jumping in the car and playing somewhere in England or Scotland or Ireland. So challenge tour itself, like, is really tough, I think, you know, to get then get off the challenge onto DP world. That's uh, that's massive. And I think people don't appreciate that how much it does cost to do this. And look, I'm great. I'm really glad you got your card back. We'll talk more about what you see coming for next year. But I, I want to cover off the fact that it, now the age you turned pro sounds older now because many people turn pro at 18, 19, 20. They go do two years at college in America. They're coming out at 20, 21, 22. But you turned, you turned pro when you were 24. But golf, although it was a passion, you are you had trials to be a professional footballer. You were, you were a very good footballer. So what was, the, what was that like, doing your trials? And, and what was it like making that decision to go, do you know what, I think I'll, I'll, ch- I'll chase the smaller white ball rather than the bigger white ball? Um, obviously, I used to love playing football when I was younger, younger kid. As I got older, I just fell out of love with it, if I'm honest, Ben. Um, yeah, maybe had a chance to go on pro, but it was tough. Honestly, I don't think I was good enough. And when I didn't get the contracts I wanted, that made my mind up. Then that, that was easy for me. I threw myself into my education, into golf, and went off to you know to America, do a golf scholarship, and I really helped my golf. Um, and at the same time, I love golf, you know. I, my passion for golf was a lot stronger than it was for football. So it was an easy transition to go away from football and pursue my dreams in golf. So um, I think the golf, the football story is a little bit, again, blah, I wasn't quite good enough, Ben, to be honest, but, and my love for it wasn't wasn't there. But at golf, I just threw myself into it and really dedicated myself um, to move up the levels and to get where I needed to get to. But football still holds a dear dear place in your heart. You're you're an avid Cardiff City fan, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I love watching Cardiff. Um, watched them again on the weekend. Um, great fun. Take my little lad down to some of the games now, and he's enjoying it. He plays his football on Saturday morning, so uh, yeah, I do I do enjoy watching them. Well, that's that's great to hear, and it's um. Listeners, viewers to our show know that I I started off as a, as a semi pro cricketer and and got a bit of boot money and this, that and the other. And I just wasn't good enough. And I think that I'm also not very good at golf. So that's where our similarities uh, end there, Stuart. But I think that I I speak to a lot of golfers that it tends to be, they're also quite good at another sport. It does. There are very few golfers I ever speak to that aren't good at other things. Mm. Yeah, I I agree. I I was the same cricket. I I, I really liked cricket as well when I was young and I was fairly good. Obviously not that great, but again, I think the hand-eye coordination from golf to that help. Obviously, football. I played a tiny bit of rugby, but everything really. Tennis. I, you know, I, I kind of liked all sports. I, I definitely think it helps. And then to focus on like that one sport in the end, I think that variety of several sports definitely rounds you off as a sports person. Well, it's it's got to be, isn't it? Because I think the ability to apply yourself to different sports can really 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 helping golf and i find that i play golf better and hey you're the dp world tour pro i find better when i'm in a zone where i'm concentrating but not obsessing and i think having had the ability to play some team sports sometimes you've got the ability to concentrate but be aware of other things do you find there's a do you find there's a place where you play your better golf mentally i think with golf what really grabbed me was like because it's an individual sport, um, it was always in your own hands. What you shot was your score. Nobody could take that away from you, Ben. You know, whereas football, when I was growing up, it was never. It's, you're not in total control. You could have a great game, but somebody else might see that you haven't played that well, and you might have. You know, it was in their hands. Whereas I think when golf, I really started to get into golf 
I could practice so hard, I could improve all by myself, and then I could shoot the scores I needed to to progress, and it was all in my own hands, you know? So that that's what I like. I like, I like the individuality about it. Um, although I do like dipping back into the team sports, obviously representing Wales at golf, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That doesn't happen very often, obviously, because there's not much team golf in, in our sport. But um, that's why I love the individuality about golf. No, that's fantastic. And I think I made a joke before we started, or maybe I've even done it here, that with you getting back on tour and your success a little again, a little bit later, because you've, you've lost and gained the card, lost the card, gained the card. Blandy kind of went through a very similar thing, didn't he? He had a couple of years where he wasn't where he wanted to be and then got back on tour. How do you, how do you think it is these days with so many of these young guns? You look at some of the, you go to these places and look, I've got your driving data up on the, up on the screen. And I think, when you look at your driving data, you are one of the, you were in 2019 and 2017, your last two, four years on tour, you ranked sixth in 19 and 10th in 2019, uh, 2017 for driving accuracy on the whole yep. of the DP World Tour. Mm-hmm. And I, we played together and I did joke to you about, is there any chance you will ever, mi- ever miss the center of a fairway? It didn't feel, it didn't feel like you were let alone going to miss a fairway, but you weren't going to miss the center of a fairway. It was, it, it was, it was, it was just obscenely straight all of the time. But obviously the elephant in the room is that, is that distance piece and you ranked 169 and 168 on distance. Have you worked on distance and, and what do you feel about some of these younger lads coming through who they're coming through at 18, 19 and they're, and they're, they're, they're cruising at 315, 320 carry. Yeah. Sick. It's a different game though, to be honest, Ben, back in the day, like it was all about, you were taught how to position the golf ball, where you want to play from. I think now the youngsters are almost taught, right? Hit it as hard as you possibly can roughly in that direction go find it and play from there i think we were taught differently and yeah going back to where like me yeah i am trying to obviously always improve my speed my club sb ball speed i am trying every day believe me trust me um you can ask my coach i was with him yesterday and that is a big topic and it's been a big topic for three or four five years now i've sent 44 probably started I, I I wouldn't say I've lost speed. I think just everybody else and technology, I think pe- more people have gained. So I'm just trying to almost stick around where I'm at. Maybe if I can pinch a few more miles per hour, that would be great. Um, like you said, I'm a very accurate player. So certain golf courses suit me more than others. So when I get on a, a tight, uh, um, shorter golf course, I'm like, I'm licking my lips. If you look at my results this year, some of the golf courses are very tight, very tricky, and that's where I had my biggest results. So you've got to pick and choose your battles. At the same time, I can't get too obsessive because if I search, like other golfers have searched over the years, if you go searching for that extra speed, you can lose your accuracy. And Luke, Luke Donald being the biggest example, Luke, like Donald, Luke, Luke Donald wrecked a career in many, many people's there's eyes. There's other players I could name, even Ryder Cup players, you know, you wouldn't, you know. You, they, it happens and um, so you've got to be careful like my coach says like if you can just improve your putting or your pitching a tiny amount that can negate maybe some of the distance you haven't got but it is something we're searching but at the same time part a lot of my game is all about accuracy and distance control and and I you know like let's, let's be honest I'm 44 now am I going to be a power hitter now am I going to change that much probably not and if I can maintain with what I've got now and improve tiny little other areas of my game like my pitch my putt in the wedge play which is still pretty good now but if I can just squeeze a little bit more it's probably easier to squeeze more of that side of my game than it is to try and get that distance so you've got to be careful but these young kids yeah these young kids just are sick how good and how long they are and it annoys the hell out of me but that's that's the game in it yeah, and you said about not losing much power, and to be fair, since 2014, you've been been the same with a tiny bit of an increase through there. Anyone that knows me or no Washington show knows that I like I like a stat and I like a bit of it. And interesting, you mentioned your your um your coach talking about putting. Because look look at look your putting stats, you're not far off of if you could if you could improve like 0.25 putts around. Yeah, you'd be in exactly. the top. You'd be in the top. So we're, we're talking one putt an event. Really, aren't yeah. we? Yeah, not two five putts around. You'll you'll be in the top based on the old stats, which I'm looking at. They don't really change much. You'll be in the top ten or twelve on putting. So all of a sudden, if you can still be top ten on driving accuracy and top mm-hmm. fifteen on putting, 
that that's that's a that's a fairly good set of stats. Yeah, exactly. And I think like the last couple of years, I've played and hit the golf ball very well. And we've looked at the putting stats, and they've not quite been where they should be. So this season, I think maybe the first half of the season, we really worked hard on the putting, and my putting improved and. That's where I think I've had the big results this year. I've had some big putting weeks, and I've still hit it solid enough. I've picked the right golf course, and that's how I've come out with, a, like, obviously a win, a second, a fourth place. I've putted very well. Whereas the last couple of years, I've been very solid tee to green, and I've probably actually improved that area, but my putting um, regressed a little bit. So that was quite pleasing this year to, to putt, and it just shows how important, obviously, still the putting is. Sorry, mate, I've lost sound. Oh, there we are. Do yeah, apologize. Because- That'll Going be edited. The, the magic of the editing. Mark will either take that out or leave that in to make me look stupid. Either way, yeah, I'm fine. I, I didn't hear that last couple of uh, sentences. The, the, Sorry, mate. The wonder of um, Google is you reading putts. So if anyone types in Stuart Manley into Google, I mean, just how many of these photos are around, Stuart? It just seems to be the photos you down on all fours reading a putt. It seems to be everywhere. Yeah, there's a few. I've got to be careful now getting on 44. I'm struggling to get back up from that position these days. You know what I mean? So, uh, uh, but to be honest, man, that's the only way I see the, the line, the contours of the green so much better from almost green with green height almost. You know what I mean? So, um, if I look at the putt, you can roughly tell from standing behind it. But honestly, when I get down, I, I see it perfectly. And um, I've always done it. And I well, hopefully touch what I'll always do as long as I can get down and get back up quick enough, you know? I think it's one of those things that if it helps you putt better, who gives? Who cares? Like, no, as long, you know, as long as you're not yeah. damaging the green and you're not taking too long. Obviously, speed of play is always important. So, but for me, getting down, getting it takes seconds, you know, and I, I see it straight away, and, and I'm back up, and I'm back into my routine, and uh, hopefully knocking it in. Well, Brooks Kepka's infamously gets very low as well. He does that sort of weird sideways squat thing that looks like, again, if I got into that position, I might not be able to get back up. But yeah. there are a lot of players that get down low. But I've, I've noticed that I'm not sure how much golf you watch on TV and be interesting to hear your thoughts on that. But I watch a lot of golf on TV and I've played in a lot of pro-ams. And it's amazing how many players get their caddies to get down low. Um, so, so they are still getting that information. It's just they're getting someone else to do it for them. No, my, my, the caddies I've always had have never done that. Um, they've always had a look or whatever if I've asked them. But, yeah, they haven't gone yeah that low. Um, most of the caddies I've had recently, are they've actually been good players. So uh, they've done their own kind of little routine. And, yeah, they, they just look from behind. But they, they didn't ever get down that low, to be honest. Well, they don't need to. You're doing that. You're taking it for them. Yeah. Um, so we've touched on a few things. I want to talk about Liv. Obviously, when we last met, Liv didn't exist, hadn't been spoken of, no one had thought about it. In uh, 20 days' time, there's a big qualifying event for Liv. Have you ever looked at Liv, thought about Liv, what are your opinions of it? Just I'd be interested just to understand your viewpoint on, on Liv Golf. Yeah, I've actually thought about it. Um, I thought about it a couple of years. Um, I'm just thinking, was it? La- it was last year. I think I went. I got released by the the DP Tour, and I went and played an Asian Tour event up in Slaley Hall. Yeah, yeah. And I think if I'd been a couple of shots better, two or three shots, or whatever it was, I actually would have got into that live event the following week. Um, and I would have played as long as long as the DP World would have allowed it. I think the they would have allowed it because I wasn't into the European or the, the DP world event that week. So, mm. um, yeah, I have looked at it and obviously the, there's a qualifier coming up. Like you said, I actually looked at that as well. Unfortunately, I wasn't high enough ranked or exempt to get into it. Um, and it does clash as well at the same time with the DP world tour. So I don't know what the stance is if they were allow players, but, um, I think maybe is it the PJ Tour? Are they allowing players to, to yeah, try PGA, and qualify? PJ Tour are allowing players to go into qualifying event as long as they're not blocked by an event. And I mm. think Keith Pelly has said that that you would need a release whether you were playing in the DP World Tour event or not. I'm not going to get into politics. I think it's a, I think it's a bit harsh to ask someone to get a release if they haven't got an opportunity to play somewhere else. I think it's denying an opportunity oh, yeah. to work. Hundred percent, yeah. If, if you're not playing somewhere and you've got an opportunity to play, hundred percent, you should um, you should go play. You should be allowed to play. Um, for me personally, I think if guys want to go play live, let them go. You know, 
Um, I don't know what's happening with the merger right now. I haven't really read much about it recently. Um, I don't think but, anyone knows, Stuart. It's, yeah, it's slow it's up in the air. One week it's on, one week it's off. Yeah, exactly. So it'd be nice to kind of know what's happening. But hopefully, you know, some of the money feeds down maybe from the, not the live tour itself, but they're, they're obviously um, their team or whatever. And PJ Tour, obviously, we've got that. Um, merger with the European DP World Tour. So hopefully money feeds down. Hopefully money feeds down at the Challenge Tour. Them guys really obviously need it down there. And hopefully some of the money goes into the Seniors Tour because I won't be far off that in a few years' time. Yes, yeah, so, well, obviously um, our mutual friend Scott Drummond is on the Senior Tour in full, isn't he? From I think it's from April. Yes, um, yeah. so Scotty's back on tour, which is mm. great. Um, yeah. And hopefully that hopefully Scotty can stay on the Senior Tour for a long time. Again, a, a little bit like yourself, Scotty, is very straight and it's it does seem to be there are there's that sort of almost those that are just 40 and over missed that year those years of just whack it and find it <laughs> yeah it seems that way doesn't it? i think it's that era probably from just after well probably 10 years after me or whatever but they seem like we were always taught it was always positional golf um there was no massive hitters out there back then uk you'd have a couple of freaky guys but they were always still taught as well just to you know try and hit the fairways but now you're almost like the data is out there isn't it everybody's got a track man every coach has got one and it, it can be seen and everybody's comparing themselves against long hitters and they're always searching and getting longer and just yeah it's frightening how long guys are now you know the club has been created and i've spent time on the on the range at a few different pro events and with press passes so you can get to wander around and Stu, most most of them have got two tra two like ra two radars they've got the quad they've got the track man they've got the full swing they've usually got two because they give slightly different readings You're thinking i know these guys have got loads of money there and they're, they're on the full tour they've had tour cards for five six years whatever else and they've earned some good money they've got like 40 grand's worth of clobber in tech stood behind him and they got they got one guy reading out numbers and giving it to the coach or whatever else it's you see a lot of that and it's like bloody hell it's it's yeah. that pursuit it's that pursuit of speed yeah yeah it is and obviously they're, they're testing every session they have even like the warm-up before the round um they're testing um yeah it's crazy and it's all about numbers and data i don't know sometimes you, i just feel like they lose the feel and the, the ability to go and play. I've seen it with some of the youngsters um, in my area, like in Wales. Um, you just got to be careful. You know, sometimes, okay, it's great to have these numbers, but you still got to get that golf ball in the hole and go play, you know? Yeah, it's... As my, as my uncle says, it's not always how far, it's how many. Yeah, now, exactly. Obviously, being closer to the flag can make it easier, but I, I still think there's a lot of... There's a lot to be said for that for that phrase. It's not how, it's not how far, it's how many. Um, I would like just to touch very quickly on yep. what it is like as a as a pro. I know you said about it, you've lost it a few times and it's lo losing a card is hard. What's it like getting the card back and looking at the calendar and looking at the diary and do, do the floods of text come in? What do you start doing? What do you start thinking? What are your sponsors saying? Let, let, let's talk about, you've, you've been very honest and said it's bloody hard to lose it. Let's talk about the positive stuff. You won the card back three weeks it was three four weeks ago whatever it was apologies yeah, two weeks ago yeah two weeks ago you won the card back what what's the last two weeks been like for you with planning and sponsors and family and i guess i guess your wife knows you're not going to be around as much <laughs> no but at least at least with the, the dp world the the schedule is already out it's planned um you know where you are for that year so my wife's happy with that she can book several holidays which she likes to do in advance um but yeah, the first few days after getting in the card is crazy. Obviously, you got a million text messages, and um, which is really nice. To be fair, uh, you speak to the sponsors, and hopefully, like they're on board for the following season. And then, and then, literally after a couple of days, I'm down with my court, and we're thinking, right, okay, what we need to work on the next couple of weeks because I've got a month on the road now. So uh, it doesn't really, yeah, you don't really get much of a break. So it's non-stop, but it is nice looking at that schedule thinking, all oh, right, I can't wait to go to Japan. Or I can't wait to go to where, you know, Leopard Creek in South Africa in a few weeks' time. You know, just, it is nice. because That's they're, the they're one great that's opposite Liv. Yeah, that's the one. It's the Leopard Creek one that's opposite Liv, yeah. It is, right. Yeah, that's right. 
so it is nice looking at them. And then you look at like you know where's the British events and where's the Irish because they're all they're all great events. So it is nice looking at the schedule. To be fair, I think oh, I can't wait to be playing in that team up next uh, year and that. And are you taking on new sponsors? Are you fully sponsored up? Are you fully logoed up? How does that work for you? Are you are you looking for X, Y, and Z? Have you got a business manager who's trying to find something? What's the yeah, I've got a manager, Jeremy Robinson. I've been with him several, quite a few years now with Blackstar Golf. Um, oh, is, is he, it the guys at Blackstar, is it? Yes. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, I've, I've met one of those through through Drum and through Ben Hortop. Yeah. yeah, yeah, good, really good guys. I've been with them for years, actually. Um, I've got a couple of sponsors, which are staying on board for next season, which is amazing. Like, Nord Dan have been with me for a good few years now. I've got a local guy who are a very good friend of mine, uh, Paul Davis at Ramsey and White. I grew up playing golf with him and he's on board next year, which is great news. So, But obviously I'm still looking for more sponsors because, was it, 30 events I'm going to play next year and obviously it's pretty damn expensive, isn't it, to travel the world. Um, but hopefully, yeah, get a couple of couple of more back on board and that will take the pressure off a little bit. So that'll be great. No, I, I, I hope it will happen. And I think, it, and, and hopefully things like this will help. Um, as I said, I've met you, spent a bit of time with you. You're a thoroughly lovely man. <clears throat> we, we don't interview people unless we like them, just because <laughs> you've got your tour card back. There's numerous people who've got tour cards back, but boy, we only want to bother with people we like. Um, so I'll talk very quickly about when we played. Do you remember? Do you remember how you tore that, that course to pieces? Because you, not really, you, mate. No, I don't. We, we walked off the course, and um, we walked off the course, and you were you were you were two off the course record. Oh really? And I was like, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was but you, you, we were just knocking it round. Like you, 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 you spent more time making the amateurs enjoy their event and the amateurs enjoy it than you did focusing on your golf, and and was still only two off the course record. Yeah, like it's just obviously I'm there. I'm not there to really think about competing. I'm there like to have a good time for you guys, chat and get to know you guys. And obviously, Scott Drummond, who runs those, you know. You know, you got to make you, you you guys feel good, and hopefully you enjoy your day. And at the same time, playing Sunday Heath, I think that might have been the first time I played it as well. It's a lovely yeah. little golf course, isn't it? Really, really enjoy the ba- the bacon roll there before best I'm bacon. It's, it's gammon, best bacon, isn't it? Yeah, but, mate, that's the best bacon roll you know any any golf course I've had. But um, yeah, it's a, it's. A, what I liked about it as well, obviously, is 18 holes, but they're, they're quite short and you're around it in no time at all, which is nice. You know, the, the, the day flowed really nicely. I think everybody enjoys themselves. Everybody's happy. You know how on the golf course for five hours in, I don't think the weather was that great, was it, um, back then? So It, it had it, rained heavily the day, be- the day before. Yes. We, we were dry, but the ground yeah, was... That's but it. the greens um, were superb. Unbelievable. Like, the greens are probably like, one of the best greens you'll play and... For that to be just a, a small little golf course, I, I strongly recommend people to to visit there. It's such a such a nice little place, isn't it? Yeah, it's up. For those who don't know, Sunningdale Heath shares the same land as Sunningdale. Yeah. Um, back in the nineteen oh whatever, the the ladies and wives of the members of Sunningdale wanted somewhere to play. That's um, it, the, yeah. men, the men weren't having any of it, letting them on their course, so they got the bit of land next door and they laid out an eighteen hole track for the ladies. And you say it's quite, it is quite, Scott, it's four, it's, it's 14 par threes, four yeah. par fours, three of the par three, four of the par threes are over 200 yards. So it's, yeah, they're, they're quite long, long some of them, aren't they? Yeah, they're quite long. I'd, I'd had a, I had a fairly decent start. I was, I was two over through five and we were just chatting and then I hit a bad chip and a bad chip and another bad chip, which it wasn't a good part of my game now. And you're one of the few people, couple of people I credit to being a better short game player. And I said, Stuart, come on, what's my tips? And you went, stop thinking. If you can't contact it, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> and, you, and you said, if you contact, if you don't make a solid contact, it doesn't matter what you're planning or where you're looking or what you're trying to do or to check it, to stop it, to roll it out. If you're not making pure contact, it doesn't matter. And, and I just went, oh yeah, I'm think- I was thinking way too much about slide it underneath, dip, do this get across it like that. What I was thinking about everything other than making pure contact. Mm. And it was just a very simple, just, just contact the ball. Yeah. Do you find that on pro-ams you get to do a lot of that, just give very simple one-liners to help people? Yeah, very. most of the time as well it is short game because 
I don't think obviously higher handicappers concentrate or have too many lessons on their short game. Obviously, they're more obsessed with hitting the ball, get off the tee, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And if they could just shut up in their short game like a tiny amount and make it a little bit more simple, like most of the tips I give are always like, don't always play the lob wedge, you know, take the, the, the pitching wedge or the nine iron, you know, make the wrists a little bit stiffer and almost make little putting strokes, you know, and get that ball running and you'll be amazed how much closer you'll get the, the ball to the hole over a certain period of shots and over a round if you just did that a couple of times you're saving two three four shots around and next year your handicaps plummeted down and i don't think the amateurs appreciate that you know i know i think i couldn't agree more i think there is a there is too many there are too many people there is too many, there are too many people so you say put the lob wedge away they're looking yeah. to they're looking to hit a, hit a flop a flop shot off of tightly mown grass yeah. off a downhill lie when they're short sided. Yeah, and that day was, the... that day the turf was very wet as well, wasn't it? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And it's it's even harder. You just always get the ball kind of like a little nine nine, a little bit more uh flange on the bottom of the club there, a little bit more help from the club and uh it won't dig in and get the ball running and uh yeah, people just don't you know, it maybe it doesn't look great or whatever. You know, people think, Oh, I gotta get a little bit of check on it, a bit of spin on it and a bit more loft. I'm like, oh, that's a high percentage shot. It's very risky. There's no need, you know? It's the amount of people that get the ball airborne when there's yeah. nothing in front of them. They no, don't no. need to, they don't need to get the ball thirty foot in the air and land it softly because no, exactly. they've got nine foot of fringe. I know. Sorry, nine, 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 foot, nine foot of apron. They don't need yeah. to do anything else. No, exactly, exactly. Look, we're coming to the end of it. I've got a few questions that we asked. So I've got a question from a viewer, um, Russell Jones, who's played at Mountain Ash a few times, and he said, please can you advise me how on earth anyone's meant to hold the first green at Mountain Ash in the summer? Oh, that's easy enough. You just gotta land it just short on the left and let the bank kill it, and the bank, uh, the ball will just roll down the bank easy. Never try and pitch it. It's uh, yeah, it's normally quite firm up there. The watering system is not as good, as, let's say, as um, other courses. And um, yeah, gotta land it short, and you gotta use the bank on the left. There you are, Russell. Hopefully that saves you a shot next time. And then yeah. we have a couple of quick fire questions before we end. What's your love and hate club in the bag? Love my lob wedge. I haven't just said all of that. You love it. I like. I like that. Yeah, I love my lob wedge. I love my driver. Love my driver. Um, well, you haven't. Hit, you I... haven't hit the ball more than two inches off a straight for ten years. <laughs> uh, my nemesis would probably be probably a long iron. Probably my worst. That's probably my worst. You know, a long iron over water off an iffy lie. <laughs> that's that's what I wouldn't like. That's hence why I got a rescue. <laughs> Hopefully Leopard Creek, you're not carrying too much water with those long irons and you're in better positions. Exactly. Um, Hopefully it's firm. So we just finished a round of golf, 18 holes, nice summer's day. What's the drink going to be and what's the food going to be post-round? Oh, probably a nice cold Peroni would be the the drink. Food, ah, anything really. I'll, I'll eat anything. Nice chicken burger, some sweet potato fries, that'll do. Oh, lovely stuff. Um you got 90 minutes spare, plans have just been cancelled. What are you going to do? Are you going to go and play nine holes on your own or a range session? What was the second part? So nine holes on your yeah. own or a range range session? Oh, good minutes, question. I, love, I love both. It depends what time of year. Like Obviously, I love nine holes on my own. I really love that because I'll throw a few balls down, hit several shots with each club, and then kind of experiment. And at the same time, I love grinding on the range. I love doing kind of drills from my coach so both that's a tough one uh probably nine holes if the weather's good nine holes what's your favorite course you've ever played on tour so as a pro and your favorite course that you've played that wasn't a tour course oh um i've got oh, i've got several several favorites really on tour i, I played a world cup at Royal Melbourne, I thought that was fantastic. I love Leopard Creek, like I mentioned earlier, and I love the old course. Them three, probably my top three. Mm. Um, favorite course, which I oh, saying that oh, I love Hong Kong as well. Hong Kong uh, Golf Club is amazing. What's my favorite golf course? You, you lost, in- you lost in a playoff at Hong- in Hong Kong, didn't you, to Jimenez? Is that right? That's right. Yeah. So that that golf course is amazing. To be fair, it's tough. Them, them three or four courses, they they are awesome. I guess. I guess, okay, Royal Melbourne is not on tour. That was kind of the World Cup is separate to the tour, so we'll go with Royal Melbourne. 
Okay, brilliant. Look, Stuart, thank you so much for your time today. No worries, um, I think everybody, if anybody listening to this doesn't wish you the best to keep your tour card and have a have a million pound year, then yeah. they're, a, they're a cruel, cruel person. Stuart, thank you so much. Um, I hope everyone's enjoyed it. And uh, don't forget to check out First Events Leopard Creek. No, first event, I think it's the Joe Burg Open next week. Okay, so first event's the Joe Burg Open. Then, then I think South African Open, then it's Leopard Creek. Uh, go, and get, go and get a few quid on Stuart, because uh, yeah. that, 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 that'd, be, that'd be a nice prize for all of us. Stuart wins and we can win a few quid. Thank you so much, my friend. We'll speak no again. Worries, take care. No, take care, mate. Bye.